we are joined today by four panelists from really um, interesting, unique backgrounds. Um, we have David Bragdon, who is the um, the um, is with Transit Center, um, which is a think tank um, and nonprofit that supports transit and transit advocates across the country, based in New York. Uh, we have Kathleen Ferrier. She is the director of policy for council member Chris Ward. Um, we have Sharon Cooney, who is the deputy CEO with, uh, with MTS. And we have Clint Daniels, who is a planner, a senior man, uh, planner with, uh, um, I'm totally blanking, WSP. WSP. Thank you. <laughs> Did not have that in front of me. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us for our panel on the impacts of um, COVID-19 on transportation. Uh, I hope everyone here is healthy and well and coping as best as they can and that your family is also doing well. Um, but, uh, you know, transportation is an important part of our lives. Some of us are transportation professionals and some of us are transportation enthusiasts because we know how it can impact our lives for the better or for the worse based on issues of access, of equity. Um, and uh, so it's, it's been really fascinating seeing how um, our public health response to this um, huge threat has, has impacted the transportation sector. Obviously, it's had a lot of negative impacts, especially on transit, um, but essential workers rely on transit. Transit is an essential component of our public health response to coronavirus. There's also been some interesting positive um, impacts uh, that have resulted from this, including the fact that uh, in California, fatal traffic collisions are down 50%, while call, car travel is down by 60%. Um, I hope you all have noticed how, how much air quality has improved um, in San Diego, and I think across the country as well. Um, and some places are really innovating with how they use the public right of way in terms of making sure we have shared space for everyone with the reduced car traffic and with the need to um, have more space uh, between people walking. So with that, I'm gonna transition to um, our questions for our panelists. I'll start with a question for, uh, for David Bragdon with Transit Center. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what's been happening at the national level in terms of how coronavirus has impacted transit? Um, yeah, we'll start with that. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. And it's, it's, it's always good to work with Circulate San Diego. Sorry about these circumstances, but we have been longstanding supporters of Circulate San Diego. We support groups in major cities across the country and Circulate was one of the first ones. And we continue to work with them and happy about their victories with regard to, for example, that rezoning ordinance that you recently achieved. So hats off to you and mayor and city council for, for doing that. Uh, as Maya said, we are a, a civic foundation. We work uh, to improve transit in major cities across mm -hmm. the country. And so we've been watching the situation really closely and can report to you on what, what's, what's going on in, in, a, in a variety of places. One of the things that's become really clear that maybe a lot of people hadn't thought of before is that transit is actually part of the response that transit is literally a first responder and that it is part of the public health system. And that transit workers, of course, are themselves essential workers, but they're essential workers because so many other essential workers depend on them to get to work. National, nationally, we've, we've just over the last two weeks done this. And I think a lot, of, a lot of folks, we're like a lot of folks, we're doing analysis and looking at things in sort of a new way and things that maybe we knew instinctively, we're really, we're really verifying what those look like. And what we found is that nationally, about a third of transit passengers, transit riders on a normal day, just a normal pre-pandemic day, are people who work in what are now deemed essential industries, essential jobs. Predominantly, of course, most visibly healthcare, uh, where a tremendous number of healthcare workers, hospital workers commute uh, by, by transit. 
and that hospitals themselves tend to be large trip generators for both patients and staff. You know, things we knew, but wow, it really becomes clear. And so what we found is that nationally, that's 2.8 million Americans who are in that. And I say not just healthcare, I give that as the most obvious one, but other things that we take for granted most of the time, like food service workers, food distribution workers, the whole supply chain for everything that we eat. If you look at who's working in warehouses, who's working in those distribution centers and how they get their you know, transit, transit riders are a big component of that. 2.8 million nationally, 305,000 people in California every day. And like I say, that used to be, in, in California, it's about 34%. Of, so it's right, right about the national average when I say a third uh, on a normal day. Well, of course, today, they're close to 100% of the people who are, who are depending on transit. They are the people who keep things going. So what, what we've found is um, varies across the map in terms of both how agencies are able to respond and also how they are protecting their own workforce. That's something that's been very concerning to us as well as to people who, who work on transit, that the transit workers are putting themselves in harm's way. So we as an advocacy organization and our affiliates around the country are really urging greatest possible care be extended to make sure that there's protective equipment for, for transit operators and that they're following practices like allowing and requiring boarding buses through the back door, uh, suspending fare collections so that people aren't handling cash and having to interact with the operator, signs on the seats to stagger seating, limits on how many people are gonna be on any particular bus and so that there can be sufficient space between them. There are also all kinds of practices that we are sharing and learning from, for example, Pittsburgh, where they've changed the check-in procedures for drivers to minimize the interaction when they come in and changing the shifts to minimize fatigue. A whole variety of things that we are sharing with agency. And after the Public Transit Association is, is, is very active in doing that as well. Also nationally, you're aware today the figures came out in terms of last Friday's bill, in terms of the relief package. So, you know, MTS and their affiliated agencies, I think over $300 million. We think it's important to not talk about that as stimulus because it literally is not. It is literally a reimbursement for the foregone ridership revenue and the increased costs that agencies are suffering. We, we estimated two weeks ago that probably over the year, the losses in terms of the shortfall for transit agencies nationally, 26 to 38 billion, which is a combination of fares that they're not going to collect, sales tax revenues being down, and so their tax support being reduced, and then the increased costs, not just the additional cleaning, the overtime, the, the, the sick leave, and the other expenses. So, of course, if transit were just a business, they would just close and not operate during this time. But it's a public service, and it's not only a public service, it's part of this public health system. So they keep going. So the, the federal stimulus, which is 25, as I see, I called it stimulus myself, the federal relief package mm -hmm. is $25 billion. And as I said, the shortfall, we think, is more like 26 to 38. It's also going to be distributed according to a formula, which is based on ridership from 2018. So it doesn't really reflect uh, the varying needs across the country. So places, for example, New York or California, uh, increasing now uh, Miami, Atlanta, other places that are now climbing that curve, uh, the places that may be suffering the most in terms of ridership drop and who are persevering and operating and incurring the cost, the, the formula doesn't really account for that. The formula is a backward looking one that just says, here's what people would have been entitled to if it was a normal day two years ago. So going forward, there needs to be some way to allocate some of these reimbursements in a way that actually reflect the costs. So finally then looking forward, we've done some analysis nationally. This is kind of rough calculations at this point for California and needs to be refined and certainly MTS and, and Sandag and, and, uh, would you know we'll have more precise figures as this evolves but in a in a normal year in California the total uh, we we anticipate that normal year in California would be about uh, well 
in, in the coming year, compared to a normal year, the, the, the fair collection decrease may be between 1.3 and $2.5 billion in fares that won't, uh, won't come in because of the ridership drop, as well as many places not collecting the fares for safety reasons. We also anticipate the downturn in economic activity, particularly in a state that is so reliant on the sales tax like California. That could amount to a billion dollars in, in foregone revenue that supports transit specifically, leading to a shortfall statewide of between four to six billion dollars. That's just the rough estimate at this point. And so clearly more will need to be done. Um, and going forward, that will be stimulus because coming out of this and the recovery, this is my really final point here, is that, uh, that reviving transit service as a means to sparking the economy, it's a really good payback actually. And in fact, there are lessons to be learned from the 2008, 2009 stimulus, which unfortunately did not support transit operations. It did support transit capital, but that takes longer to actually have an impact. And so we think that they really should be looking at, if there is a future stimulus, at supporting transit operations because it goes straight into the economy. It employs drivers and operators and then provides more service out on the street just when we, when we really will need it to provide more mobility for people as they start moving around. So that would be something to look forward to in the future is support at the federal level uh, as well as state level for direct operations of transit and, and not looking at the stimulus as necessarily something where we just do a bunch of road widening projects that actually don't necessarily actually employ people and don't have environmental benefits either. So I think those are things to look for as we, as we move out of this phase and toward recovery. Yeah, and I will follow up in a little bit about um, how there's already a second, um, well, relief package that's being discussed focused on infrastructure. But um, now I'd like to ask Sharon, and I'm going to try and unmute you. There, you're unmuted. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how um, this, uh, uh, how coronavirus has impacted MTS, um, where you're at today. What, what is the baseline today in San Diego? Sure, well, thank you for inviting me to participate in this. Um, this has definitely been a challenge for MTS. We've been setting ourselves up for some time to increase ridership. Um, Circulate has been a real partner in that as well. And, you know, it's so depressing to think that we were up three and a half percent year over year as we exited mm -hmm. in February. Now, all of a sudden, we're down 75% in ridership um, year over year for March, and it's not looking great. But we do offer, as David mentioned, a lifeline service, and so this is something that we want to continue to sustain. Um, so far, our revenues are down about 25 million. That's, or sorry, we'll be down 25 million through June of this year. Um, we're not really making projections for after June because who knows what's going to happen with the economy. Um, we're very concerned about it, but thankfully the CARES Act has given us a little bit of breather room. We're able to take care of some things and help offset some of these revenue losses. Um, and then also to help us with some of the expenses related to the, um, you know, what we're doing to try to mitigate for the coronavirus amongst our customers and our employees. So we've worked really hard, um, you know, to kind of bolster our own um, reserves and everything else. And then with this stimulus package, we're hopeful that, you know, for at least a year, we'll be able to weather whatever this virus um, causes for us. So um, the rescue package, um, for those who haven't seen, is going to include $314 million for the San Diego region. My understanding is that's a regional total, not just for MTS, so that would be shared between MTS and NCTD, and I don't know if there's anyone else, any other agencies that would get some of that. Um, are you, um, you're saying you're, you're only looking through June, the losses through June. Um, how, how will MTS be planning what to do with that money, and are you expecting this to actually be able to cover your losses or not quite? So the portion that MTS will get is about $205 million. Um, 
And that really covers quite a bit. Um, when you consider we get about 100 million a year in fare revenue. Um, but also we want to keep our drivers. Um, one of the things that we're doing to help mitigate um, the concern for our employees and also to still keep good service on the road is uh, April 12th, we'll be initiating a cut in service that's about 25%. Um, and that's really to try to get less time in the driver's seat for a lot of our bus drivers who are really the most impacted by um, interacting with customers. Um, so some of that money will help us keep those drivers employed full time. Um, it'll help us keep our contractors so that they'll be able to staff up once this can, once people can more freely move around. Um, it'll help us do things like um, allow us to uh, work remotely. We've spent the last three or four uh, weeks, as every organization has, trying to upgrade all of our IT systems and um, get equipment in the hands of the um, people who need it to keep the jobs going, um, keep the work going so that we can keep the, the vehicles on the road and maintain. Um, so a lot of these are the types of things we're talking about. We also have a lot of leaseholds, as um, everybody knows, we are landlords as well as transit operators. Um, it brings us some revenue that helps mm -hmm. us offset the cost of operations. and. Uh, we've suspended some of those uh, leases um, for the time being, just because we know we need to keep them in their in their um, locations while the government ordered uh, shutdown is in place. So um, those are the kinds of things we'll be using the funding for. Um, and then really, once the uh, economy gets moving again, um, you know, we're, we'll we'll take a little bit of a lag um, until sales tax revenue comes back. Um, so that, that funding from the CARES Act will help us offset the loss of that kind of um, sales tax revenue. Well, thank you. Um, and then in terms of protecting riders as well as your drivers, your operators, what are the public health precautions that MTS is taking? I saw today there was a change to rear door boarding. Yes, so we started that uh, yesterday. Uh, we uh, instituted Prior to that, we had instituted immediately a movement of the standee line further back from the driver so people could maintain that six foot distance. Um, but now we're not taking cash out of the fare box. Um, we're asking everybody to just flash their pass. It's kind of an honor system on the bus. On the rail, we um, took the uh, code enforcement officers off of the vehicles so they can check from the station platform and maintain a better um, distance between themselves and the customers. And then um, we're just making sure that the employees have what they need, whether it's the um, hand sanitizer, the face masks, wipes, whatever. Um, it's very hard. Uh, every sector of the economy or of the um, essential services right now are trying to come up with the appropriate PVEs, but it's not, it's not an easy thing to come up with. Um, and we certainly know that it's more important for the medical providers to have that. Um, and then uh, we are looking at ways to social distance. Um, we're making a lot of announcements. We've got um, all our electronic media has um, announcements going all full time to tell people, you know, stay, you know, appropriate distances apart. Uh, we're maintaining a level of service so that we can keep that distance on board the vehicles as much as possible. Um, we're actually seeing a lot of really positive comments from our riders who, you know, they want to continue, they have to continue riding. They're grocery workers, hospital workers, etc. cetera. Uh, but it gives them a feeling of a sense of relief to know that they're not going to be jammed into a really packed vehicle. And then uh, we do have a stepped up um, cleaning program. Um, so at our major transit centers all day long, we have people wiping down the buttons on the trolleys, the, the railings, everything. Um, we've got um, added locations for, we have a hand washing station at every one of our trolley stops and uh, some of our bigger uh, bus stations as well. Um, we're, we're really just trying to do as much as we can to uh, maintain the safety of our um, employees as well as the riding public. 
Thanks, Sharon. So Kathleen, um, at the uh, City of San Diego, of course, you're the policy director for council member Chris Ward. Um, so you don't directly work in the transportation stormwater department, but what do you see happening in terms of um, the immediate reaction and how the city is addressing public health? And if there's any steps that they're taking um, that directly impact transportation at the city level? Yeah, thank you. And thank you again for inviting me to participate. Um, I want to take this opportunity first to really um, actually commend Sharon and MTS team. I think they've just done an amazing job um, in this crisis response and, you know, jumping into action very quickly, maintaining their workers. They've actually maintained their full workforce. Um, and then also to now they're getting into setting a new standard standard for COVID sensitive operations. And so they've really been on the front lines and um, I think they've just done a, a great job at that. Um, as far as the city, I, I believe there are actually city staff on this call. So feel free to uh, <laughs> chat uh, and add to what I'm saying. I, I just kind of wanted to keep it general about some opportunities that I see. Um, certainly, I can speak to the city's COVID response to date. There have been two um, council meetings um, in this emergency time, but that those meetings have really focused on providing shelter to our unsheltered residents in San Diego, helping tenants and then businesses um, pay rent, um, deal with this crisis. And so uh, I don't think there has been any major move yet on transportation, um, but certainly, um, you know, there, it is very clear that our streets are empty of cars and that more people are getting out walking and biking. And as a city and the county have moved to um, close these large areas where there have been public gatherings, I think it really raises a question of um, access around the city, how people can have sort of equal access. Of course, we, San Diego is famous for these large gathering spots. We've got the beaches and major parks um, but I think it really raises a question, how do we ensure that if we're starting to see more people use our streets, um, walking, biking, I've seen a lot of families out there, um, and streets all within our neighborhoods, um, how do we ensure that that trend can continue? And uh, I think some of the things that the city has already been working on are signs of progress and certainly should continue. And those are things like uh, low cost approaches to ensuring that um, we can provide safer walking and biking. We've seen other cities do that. The city has been working on, of course, striping more bike lanes with repaving. And most recently, uh, we were working my office with MTS and uh, Council President Georgette Gomez and the mayor's office in um, striping a bus only lane on El Cajon Boulevard. So perhaps we can talk more about that throughout the call. But um, in the next couple of months for the city, we're going to be focusing on next year's fiscal budget, which is always um, a big endeavor. And as far as the city's response to transportation, uh, one is to ensure safety, and then two is to uh, deal with this crisis because the city will also have a pretty significant impact to our budget as far as revenues. Um, and so how can we ensure, again, that um, we continue providing safe access for people throughout uh, San Diego's neighborhoods? Thank you. Yeah, I was actually going to be asking you about this revenue loss. I know we're approaching the release of the city of San Diego's um, draft proposed budget. Um, I think we should all be expecting a major hit to the city's finances and to all of our agency's finances. Um, and uh, I'm sure that that will impact transportation projects and Vision Zero. Um, Kathleen, do you, do you have any predictions or are you able to tell us how much we need to brace for um, that loss in revenue and how it will impact transportation projects and Vision Zero projects? Uh, I don't have all of that information. Um, I will let you know the, the mayor is due to uh, release his budget um, April 15th for the city. And then we go into a process where it's a back and forth with council, city departments, and the mayor and determining a final budget um, by mid-June. Um, the early um, estimates are that the city is going to lose at least 10% of its revenue. We, we get a lot of money from visitors paying hotel occupancy taxes, 
obviously sales tax. Um, and so we're going to see the biggest hit in that category. Um, I think department wide, and again, they're folks on the phone, but it could be up to 20% uh, reduction that they may need to take uh, in order to submit their own departmental budgets. Uh, but again, all that being said, it's, it's, I mean, it's going to be a, a challenge for us like cities across the country. Um, but again, I think that as far as transportation really uh, demands and, and highlights the need for um, solutions that we can manage with the budget that we have. And we know that's been a trend in other cities uh, for years. And San Diego has had um, some sort of dipped its toe into that. But I think that um, there's, there's more opportunities. I think that the downtown uh, mobility plan, the uh, protected bikeways that we've seen there, that's in uh, Council Member Ward's uh, district. And you know we've seen a tremendous um, increase in the amount of ridership we've seen in those, and it's um, largely uh, paint and um, protectors. And of course, it's not that simple, but um, that being said, a lot more of that can be done, again, to really ensure that we're providing public spaces for people to still gather um, especially when mental health in these times is so challenging, um, and then also dealing with the budget that we will have. Thank you. Um, before I move on to asking Clint a question, um, I wanted to ask everyone to make sure you're following the chat. I see that there's been already um, some back and forth, some really interesting questions that we're going to be asking um, in a little bit. Um, so, feel free, please submit questions in the chat room. Um, Clint, as a transportation planner um, who works in San Diego and across the country, um, what do you see uh, as potentially opportunities or as major hindrances to um, moving forward um, our mission of improving transportation options, uh, improving access to walking and biking infrastructure, as well as transit. How do you see this playing out? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for setting this up. And uh, I, I think on that front, you know, this whole outbreak creates a bit of a conundrum, right? Which is that, you know, without that many people out on the streets, it provides people moving around differently, it provides some opportunities to try different things. But at the same time, we don't wanna be encouraging people to be out all the time, mingling with their neighbors and, and whatnot, as well as, you know, it, it's hard to understand in this context, any changes, what impact those changes might have in sort of a full, uh, fully operational uh, economy. But we have seen different cities around the country trying different things. Um, I think, you know, New York over the weekend closed down a, a few streets uh, within the city to provide folks uh, a little more space uh, to move around. Uh, I don't think those continued on after Monday, uh, at least not yet in a, in a permanent way, uh, but did provide people an opportunity to, you know, get off the sidewalk and get the six to 10 feet of different difference of their, their neighbors. Um, you know, San Francisco, though, on the other hand, has gone kind of in the opposite direction, which is, you know, we don't want to encourage more folks to be out there than need to be out there. Uh, and so uh, thus far, they haven't uh, gone down the path of, of opening streets up or closing streets down to auto traffic and opening them uh, more up to pedestrians and, uh, and uh, bike lanes. I, I think the one thing that I've noticed, and I think uh, Kathleen talked about it a little bit too, is just like, you know, folks are just getting out there and um, experiencing the street in their neighborhoods and their communities in a lot different way uh, at least here in San Diego, I've noticed then than they have in the past. You see a lot more uh, families out walking. Uh, you see a lot more folks out biking. Uh, my wife, who uh, bike's been hanging up in the garage for probably five mm -hmm. years, has uh, started asking about taking her bike down to go out and, and bike around the, the neighborhood. Uh, you see a lot of people just walking in the streets, uh, which I think is wonderful. Uh, and I think it's it provides an opportunity for folks to uh, experience the city in a safer way um, across the country uh, and might provide opportunities for folks who might have been uh, hesitant to try different modes of transportation, uh, particularly biking and walking to do their business. Uh, maybe now this is a good opportunity for them to try it uh, and that might create some structural shifts in the end. Um, I think too on the, the construction side, there's some interesting things going on. Uh, you know, here in San Diego, it's been uh, interesting to see, you know, the construction on 30th Street uh, more or less continue along uh, with the, uh, 
the water main, there's storm drain uh, repairs there that will eventually facilitate the, the bike lanes uh, going in on 30th Street. Uh, Beverly Hills uh, in the last few days just announced that they're going to expedite uh, the Purple Line construction uh, through their community. So trying, you know, they've been, we're not a huge fan of the Purple Line to begin with, uh, the new subway line to the sea in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but now trying to take advantage of this opportunity where there isn't much auto traffic out there to actually close down uh, streets uh, to expedite the construction during this time. So, you know, I think even uh, even sort of non-traditional ways that might uh, move projects forward faster uh, or more economically uh, uh, are interesting uh, concepts as well. So, um, I think the the big the big question though will be: Does all this hold on? You know, do folks who have tried different things now? Uh, do they hold on to the programs uh, where street closures or Chicago's um, uh, attempts at reducing the cost for bike shares and, and other programs around the country, do those hold on after this after this ends? Um, I think fundamentally in most American cities, though, uh, transit usage, bike usage, walking isn't so much a transportation issue, it's a land use issue. And so, you know, absent land use changing in these communities, uh, and providing more opportunities for folks to uh, be able to do their business in transit and on foot and on their bikes. Um, you know, when things go back to normal uh, in most of our auto-centric worlds uh, that we exist in, um, you know, I think a lot of folks are going to revert back uh, to to the to what they did before, uh, just because that's the the environment we've built for them, and that's going to be the the challenge to overcome over the long term. Absolutely. Um, so before I move on to my next question, um, I want to make sure everyone's awake since I can't see the audience all in front of me. So um, take a look at my, my background. Where am I now? Where have I magically transported myself? So just take a second and type in the answer um, in the chat room. Let's see how many people know um, our trolley stations. <laughs> Got some enthusiastic responses. Yep. Very good. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for everyone. Um, Clint referred to something I was going to bring up, which is that the city of Beverly Hills um, closed down Wilshire Boulevard, a major boulevard in LA, uh, well, in Beverly Hills. Um, citing the reduced traffic volumes um, during this crisis to expedite construction of the Purple Line. Um, the city of Bogota is adding 47 miles of bike lanes to promote social distancing. Um, for everyone on the panel, what are and everyone who's listening, you feel free to type in your answers. What are the opportunities um, are there opportunities like this to make some changes to our roads, to our transit system, while there are fewer people driving and on the roads um, without having to tap into some major capital dollars to make it happen? Are there opportunities like that in San Diego? I'd love to hear people's thoughts or nationally other examples of this happening, if you have any. Well, I mean, I think I'll just start off here with a with a quick thought to give other folks a chance to collect their thoughts too um you know i i i think sharon and um david kind of mentioned this well everybody's kind of mentioned in their comments which is the uh, the impacts on budgets um and so you know the notion particularly in san diego um you know a lot of our transit infrastructure is funded through sales tax and then matching dollars that come from the federal or state government on those sales tax dollars um those are definitely going to take a hit over the next uh, couple of years, even if there is a, a U-shaped return on this economy, you know, our sales tax is going to lag for a little while. And so I think, you know, not so much in terms of what we can do, but I think what it's going to necessitate that we do in, in San Diego and probably in a lot of other regions across the country is that, you know, think about more nimble ways of solving problems. Um, I mean, we're already kind of up, up against the, the tax uh, revenue uh, wall already, and I think this is only going to exacerbate it. And so, you know, looking to cities like Oakland, who've you know tried to do some tactical urbanism to change the streets, to change the way that people move around. I mean, I think the El Cajon Busway is a great example of that here in San Diego of, you know, trying to do something quick and cheap. Uh, I shouldn't say cheap. Do it less, ex you know, more inexpensively than you know maybe a, a larger improvement might be. But to try it, get people comfortable with it, 
uh, and to see how it works and then to roll that out in other places and to try to use our limited resources that we know are coming down the pike and use them more effectively to create more benefit for folks. I think, <laughs> yeah, my, you kind of asked two questions, Maya. One, one is transit agencies themselves using this reduced service period as a chance to do maintenance on their own facilities. And we do see that happening in some places. Yeah, there are in other places where, uh, you know, construction has, has been reduced or eliminated, but I believe BART is doing some, you know, norm, they're now closing at 9 p.m., for example, and typically they would only have a window to work between, you know, one or uh, midnight or 1 a.m. and five, so they've got a few more hours where they can do some, and I believe Muni in San Francisco, similarly, they have, they have closed the Metro Muni subway and are substituting bus service, and I think they are taking advantage of that to do some routine maintenance on their own on their own facility when the trains aren't running that they would normally have to do late at night. So that's that's one one question, uh, that's an answer to one of your questions. The other though, I think that's more exciting to the public and more visible to the public is the repurposing of street space that is normally used by automobiles and repurposing that for people. And so we see that happening in a variety of cities across the country. I believe again, San Francisco being a good example of that. New York, not so much. I think the mayors had sort of a hesitant approach to it, but there's uh, some segments of streets in different parts of, uh, of the city where, where that's happening. And sort of on the model of something that typically happens on a couple of Sundays in a summertime, uh, now becoming more of, a, of an ongoing thing. And I think people who are out and enjoying all of that are gonna say, why can't we have this 365 days a year when we are, you know, having normal lives. I mean, it, it shows what, you know, with this whole incident shows how much land as well as how much of the airshed uh, we've given over to automobiles and the absence of or the, re, the vast reduction in the use of automobiles. What that's doing for our lungs is pretty amazing the last two weeks in terms of air quality. And the same is true for, for the amount of urban space that suddenly is available for something other than speeding speeding chunks of metal <laughs> absolutely a lot of people in the comments are talking about lane conversions that could happen at this time for bus lanes and for bike infrastructure um, i know we are very very early on in this crisis to uh, necessarily talk about how we plan to make these changes but um, kathleen do you have any thoughts or comments on this as an opportunity yeah, for sure. And I, I just want to, I'd love to be on the record saying that uh, Council Member Ward in a, his budget request to the mayor for next year's budget already asked for more lane conversions or bus only lanes. So building on the success of um, the Oklahoma Boulevard um, bus only lane that was implemented recently. Um, and again, you know, it was a collaborative effort among different council members, the city, SANDAG, um, MTS and the mayor. Um, it's a great example to to build and to make to recreate in other areas of the city, and in particular, looking at um, you know access to places that aren't as accessible now, or even for different communities that don't have as much access. And I just want to say, at some point in this conversation, um, the city recently um, has put together a. Uh, an equity index for the climate plan and uh, climate action plan. And it's just such a great opportunity to really uh, raise up those communities that, have, that don't have access transportation wise to other resources in the city to really look at, even though this is again, low budget year, how do we ensure that they have better access with some of these um, new opportunities that we have? Absolutely. Um, so I want to make sure that we get to ask Sharon um, about the how this will impact the prospects of the MTS ballot measure. Um, <laughs> so I'll, yeah. Right now we're really focused on the COVID nineteen response. Um, that's really taken up most of the time for all of us. Um, Sorry, Sharon, can you? So we are um, in the coming weeks going to be having a conversation and trying some of our board members to discuss 
morning. Um, you know, but despite of, or where that might go at this point, um, we have had a really positive couple of years of outreach and feedback from the public all the stakeholders and sort of telling us where transit needs to be for San Diego in the future. Um, and it's our goal to build on that groundwork, um, you know, for the, for the upcoming year with all the great things that we're planning. The opening of the big coach trolley extension. We've got the new fare collection system, which is really going to revolutionize the way people are using our system. Um, and then we're already working on our um, recovery and marketing campaign to figure out how we're going to get our riders back once the um, COVID-19 emergency has kind of quelled back so far. So um, we're, we'll use the um, Elevate as going forward and then hopefully at some point we'll make that decision as to what, like, what are we going to do what are we going to do for Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask kind of open-ended question for everyone. If you can um, think of or elaborate a little bit what your thoughts are on the short-term, medium-term, and long-term consequences of this, um, uh, maybe positive and negative. Um, what are the impacts of this at, at those various stages um, on MTS, on transit nationally, on transportation planning, on the city's future? Um, I would like to start if I could. I think one of the positive things that we're seeing, and we're getting a lot of um, comments from the public um, about how grateful they are that we continue the service. And that we are, I think, going to see a lot of people starting to realize, that, yeah, transit is something so essential that we've got to really start looking at it. Sorry, Sharon, I'm going to interrupt, and I don't know if there's a way for you to speak closer to the mic or anything oh, sure. but you're a little quieter than everyone is that better yeah that is better okay yeah we just feel like that um going forward that this is people are, are seeing this as an essential service um and that some the more they're noticing us out there in the public um and that we're still able to operate and that people are meeting us for very important reasons that i think that it's going to have a positive impact on the image of transit, but also when you look at transit versus the automobile, and what can we do as a region to really promote that? I, can I just say one comment to that? Because I, I agree. I think I have a concern, though, and this is, I guess, just me speaking personally, that where it is an essential service that's being provided it's also at least right now not i think people feel safer in their automobiles from COVID 19 because you know they're alone and they're able to practice that social distancing so i hope that out of this that thought isn't continued so that we actually see a decline in in ridership i i want i want to see that increase or at least maintenance of where we were before I, I think that's a very real concern, and I, I think that human impulse is going to be cautious. Remember, this is this is not like an earthquake that happens and then it's over. Uh, you know, it's not a tsunami that happens and then then you rebuild. Um, the The way this will taper off will lead a, leave a lot of lingering anxiety about infection and social distancing, and I think that is a very real concern that people will perhaps accurately feel like their car is a safer place to be. And I think we have to recognize that that's gonna be a natural reaction. And the transit industry is gonna to have to work very hard to show that it's operating practices and, and workforce protection and, and what, it's, what it's doing in terms of sanitary conditions, uh, you know, is, is, is addressing that that health concern that people are going to have. I think that's true for all public spaces. I think, uh, you know, if I were a concert owner or a stadium owner, I'd be saying the same thing that, uh, or, you know, retail. I think there have been a lot of habits that are changing, including the fact that we're having this meeting in this, in this medium rather than in person. And that a lot of people, more people are working uh, this way. 
I think there's a certain amount of comfort that is growing with these lifestyle changes. I think, I, you know, I don't want to overstate them because I think we're a naturally social species and that cities themselves are, are a natural occurrence and that interacting with other people is kind of what, what we're about as a species. But I, I, I don't think it comes back overnight. It's not like the, you know, the storm clouds pass and everybody comes out and says we're going back to normal. Yeah. I mean, I also think too, it's, it's going to impact, you know, some of the, I mean, the broader transportation players as well. I mean, I think in California in particular, you know, the, the one, two punch, and I think the rightful punch that AB5 delivered to, you know, Lyft and Uber, as well as, you know, just the, the notion that, you know, can these guys weather that storm? I mean, they are going to get some uh, bailout money out of this stimulus package as well, but, or at least their drivers are, um, you know, how do they weather this storm and how do they, they move forward? And I think, you know, we were seeing with Uber and Lyft, at least here in San Diego, that the prices were starting to inch up over the last year, year and a half, as they were trying to figure out a, a business model. And I don't want to, I think MTS has been doing a lot of wonderful things as well, but I mean, I think, you know, ridership has been going going it up, up at MTS. Some of their competition has been getting more expensive. MTS has been doing a lot of great things to make their, their service better. Uh, but I do think, you know, that landscape might change coming out of this in terms of what those other private transportation providers look like over the long term. Um, the other thing I wanted to say as well, going back to one of the things that David and, and Kathleen were both talking about, you know, in terms of being able to go out there and do things quickly and, and you know, the things that we're able to do now, even though they might seem minor, you know, converting a, a, a lane to a bike lane or expanding sidewalks or something like that, those things are really hard to get rid of once they're in place. Um, I think David kind of alluded to that, but you know, we have examples of that in San Diego. I mean, Plaza de Panama, when, um, you know, uh, our, one of our prior mayors went over and basically ripped the parking lot out and put in, you know, a pedestrian mall. I mean, that today is probably one of uh, Balboa Park's greatest assets. We've seen similar things happen in New York when Bloomberg went in and, and put in pedestrian plazas along Broadway. Uh, even before that, you know, in Chicago, when you, know, you ripped out the airport, uh, Meg's Field right next to, the, to downtown and replaced it with a park. I mean, those are things that happen by fiat. Um, and I'm not necessarily advocating as a, as a planner who gets paid doing lots of environmental documents and modeling and whatnot, but sometimes uh, doing things quickly, uh, and particularly in these extreme circumstances, can provide ben long-term benefits that, um, that we should attempt to, to, to leverage in these situations. Mm -hmm. it, I'd like to add to that uh, telecommuting. I think that's just another kind of unknown um, you know, I think there's some positives and negatives there, but if just thinking about the sheer number of cars on our street, on our roads, whether it be the highway, which is obviously congested in the morning on a typical day, or just the number of cars on our neighborhood streets. And if there's a new way that companies and workers are telecommuting and freeing up some of that space, then potentially, again, that allows uh, city leaders to rethink how that space is used. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to um, now ask some questions that we got in the chat room. Uh, so don't forget, we'll, we'll still be following the chat room if you have more questions or if we haven't covered your question yet. Um, so there's a good question. Um, one question is from Jack Shu: is MTS or has anyone heard of other operators requiring riders to wear masks when they are using transit? Um, and would that be a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, that might be a better question for you, David. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Um, and I know that there are some discussions about possibly requiring it for other um, workers at places like grocery stores. I think we're going to see that within the next couple of days here in San Diego, but I don't, I haven't heard it yet um, for our transit system. Yeah. I, I have not heard it in terms of it being required for riders. Um, I have heard it being 
uh, permissive or being allowed for for the workforce. Um, and I think initially there were some properties where it was it's just sort of automatically against the rules that you, you, you didn't want employees, uh, you know, uniformed employees kind of wearing masks because nobody had contemplated a situation like that. I think a lot of the places that had those uh, restrictions have now eliminated them to to give employees that choice. And, you know, we would say you got to go one further and actually provide the employees with the equipment uh, as soon as it becomes available. I know there's a national shortage of those things, but that needs to be expedited. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Nevo, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your last name, Magnesi, um, but with the closures of city parks and trails, would you, do you think locally and, and where, wherever you have contacts with people or in New York, um, are people staying home or are people getting out and walking in their neighborhood more? And um, could that cause some potential issues since a lot of sidewalks are uh, much, are, are pretty narrow and don't really give much space for six feet um, between people walking on the sidewalk? Any thoughts on that? So I've seen some really creative use of the street space, at least in my neighborhood. Um, I've seen uh, on one street I was walking the other day, uh, folks had set up a pickleball court uh, in the middle of the street using the center line of the street as the, as the net. I've seen folks playing uh, tennis on my street. Uh, so taking over some of that park space or, or replacing some of that park space uh, with their own streets because traffic is uh, is way down. I mean, I also think though too that there should be opportunities to encourage or expand the, 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 the sidewalk. And I think, you know, an example of this that I, that I saw here in San Diego uh, recently, and it, it was before Balboa Park was closed, but you know, the, the Cabrillo Bridge, uh, I was riding my bike across the Cabrillo Bridge and uh, lots of folks were using the street to walk and, and take advantage of that. And I, I think it was unfortunate, but you know, a park ranger came through and encouraged the folks back onto the sidewalk uh, to 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 free up the space for the cars. And I think you know that would be just a, a great opportunity as maybe as parks come back online at some point in the future to you know really dedicate at least roadway space in those parks for for people and, and for bikes. Okay, I have another question from Craig. Um, how do we think this situation will impact SANDAG in the attempt to create and adopt a progressive regional transportation plan with timelines looming? Um, and will more state legislation extensions be needed? Is anyone here um, familiar with what's going on at the SANDAG level or thoughts on how they should proceed? Right. I'm looking at Sharon because I wonder if she wants to <laughs> answer. I mean, there's the planning process and then there's the funding process. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I would think that Sandeg is going to be impacted by sales tax losses. Um, Transnet is going to be impacted. Um, you know, I remember hearing um, somebody was talking to Governor Brown about, you know, the fiscal cliff that we're about to go over with um, the next quarter when sales tax receipts are coming in so soft that that's really going to have to be um, thought about when it comes to the RTP. Um, and then on top of that, you know, if, if, San, if MTS, you know, if this whole um, ballot measure concept can't go forward yet, that's got to impact how they're planning as well. So um, I think it's, everybody's taking things day to day. And don't forget too that for everybody that you know the say the regional transportation plan is important, but you know what gets into next year's budget and what gets into the five year regional transportation improvement program the the five year spending plan has a much more direct impact on what happens and what gets built than what gets into that long range transportation plan so the long range transportation plan is certainly important, but you know advocating and and being involved in the budget process and the r tip process. Uh, can help move things forward faster. So 
Um, we haven't quite talked about scooters yet, and that's been an important <laughs> part of the dialogue um, in San Diego in recent years. So um, until very recently at Circulate and other people who promote um, uh, transportation options. Um, we were marketing transit and um, as well as scooters and biking and walking um, as uh, trendy and cool and the thing to do. Um, what do you think, how, how, does, how do we adapt in these times? How do we adapt our messaging? How do we promote um, the use of all these uh, different modes of transportation? Um, like uh, like David was saying, there's there's a real prospect that people are going to be afraid to get out to get out of their cars. Um, how can we start to work on that and make sure that people um, still can you know walk, bike, take transit, um, ride scooters, um, get back into that mode of transportation? <laughs> Well, I think for us from the transit side, um, in order to market ourselves better um, afterwards, I mean, now cleanliness is going to be the thing that we really want to market. Um, uh, we're really going to be looking at kind of the, the personal stories of what people went through during this time frame. Um, I think that really focusing on the real humanity side of it, um, you know, rather than just, oh, the business side of it, um, you know, a month ago, I wouldn't even be making these kind of comments, you know, because you're always looking for the next budget. But um, this really gave the perspective of you really have to focus on the individual and what their needs are and then, you know, what, how can you cater yourself to their needs? David, are there things that we can learn from the post 9-11 world of New York where folks were kind of afraid for a very different reason, but afraid to congregate and use transit and how, how New York recovered from that? Well, I, yeah, I think so. I think it's all about personal security and comfort and um, that this is a challenge that would be common to transit, to public spaces more generally, to retail districts, to sports stadiums, theaters, uh, movie houses, you, you know, you, you name it, that certainly after September 11th, there was concern about security. And of course, there were predictions from people who have been pre-inclined pre to, you know, be sort of anti-urbanist anyway, and said, well, this is the death of cities and everybody's going to go, you know, work in office parks 30 miles away in New Jersey. And while it was a rough you know few months or even few years lower manhattan today where our office is um is is more dynamic today than it was you know on september 10th uh, 20, uh 2001 so you know the very area around ground zero is very dynamic um so so it's and it's not just that memories are short it's that there's a compelling attraction to urbanism that people want to be in places where there are other people. I think they're kind of, we're kind of wired that way. But in terms of actual policy steps that provided people with the confidence, is there was a, you know a high visibility of NYPD uh, in, in the in the subway stations in the, in and on the streets of, of of New York, and the fact that New York's anti-terrorism efforts are both very visible and also incredibly successful uh, in the sense that nothing has happened since September 11th, of, you know, uh, is, is because those things have been prevented through intelligence and through, you know, things that are visible and things that aren't visible. And so the, the confidence of New Yorkers today about terrorism i mean it's you know I, you just don't hear about it anymore and the reason you don't hear about it is because the risk has been dealt with in a way that people believe and that they're that they're confident in so i think it's that combination of things it's the the fact that it's a place people actually want to be and there's a lot 
a lot of good stuff going on and job opportunities and and excitement and um but that, uh, that also has been safe so i think i think that is what you know we need to be doing in the in the transit industry or any other any other industry where where people gather um is to be assuring that all the public health steps have been taken both in terms of prevention detection you know prophylactic measures the whole work um we're gonna have to adapt we're not i i, I just don't think human beings are all gonna scatter off and become hermits the rest of i mean just the last three weeks i don't know about you but i'm kind of ready to leave the apartment uh, i don't think we're most of us are wired to be hermits i mean that's why that's why cities have been booming the last 15 years agreed and thanks clint for asking david that question um this this is my last uh, background change. Um, so if you know what this event was, what street this was, and extra credit, if you know what year it was, enter that into the chat room, please. Um, we have more questions coming, and there's a really good one that builds on um, our, our talk, our, my question on how we're messaging this and how we're promoting um, different transportation modes. Um, so environmental justice communities in San Diego are transit dependent communities. They're not choosing, um, for the most part, they're reliant on transit. This is a question from um, Caro. Uh, so how are we ensuring that they specifically feel safe using transit? Um, are we having any targeted messaging going out to EJ communities? Um, are they being informed about these cleaning procedures? Uh, and what are we doing specifically for uh, vulnerable communities at transit um, with our transit agency, uh, but also beyond? How do we make sure that we're addressing vulnerable communities? Yeah, so, um, you know, as we've talked about, it's the transit dependent who are the ones that are still driving taking the train right now, right? They're the ones, they're the ones on the bus, they're the ones going place to place. And, and a lot of times they are from the EJ communities that um, communities of concern for us that we want to continue to keep them as our, as our customer base. Um, we have been doing a, a lot of communication to the public about what we're doing. Um, we've been focusing on the really busiest stations for the cleaning efforts and the, and the stepped up presence um, for people to have assistance um, with regard to even just making sure that they are aware that we have uh, hand washing stations and things like that. Um, we're, um, you know, want to really make sure that people who have to take transit know that we're going to keep a, enough transit on the road that they'll be able to spread out, do the things they need to do to stay safe. And of course, we did um, get rid of uh, the need to put money in the fare box and to go in through the front door. So now people can get on safely and, and go about their business. So um, these are a lot of the measures we're taking and we'll keep communicating. We're using everything from digital communication, um, Facebook, uh, webinars. Uh, we're going to have, a, in fact, a media webinar uh, Monday to talk about the service adjustments that we're talking about. Um, everything on our digital presence on the, on the platforms, on board the buses, we're making announcements. So we're really hoping to, to get the um, customer all the information they need on a daily basis. Yeah. That's good. Um, and hopefully multilingual for um, our communities uh, across San Diego. Um, can so, I, can I, could I address Car yeah. Caro's question? I think Caro asked a really good question that also involves uh, service planning and uh, during the recovery as well as now as, uh, and, and Pittsburgh I think has done an, is an example of having, having done this well and, and looked carefully at who is using transit today and that essential workforce, which actually overlaps quite a bit with lower income people and often is people of color. And so while, you know, most transit agencies are seeing these big ridership drops, those drops are not uniformly distributed across a city or across the, 
the, the customer base because, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the people who are still riding transit that, that are normally a third of the transit ridership, they're now 100% or nearly 100% of the transit ridership, tend to be concentrated in, in lower income parts of town. And the origins and destinations are also different than normal times because the downtown office district uh, tends to be right now be a little more deserted, whereas food distribution centers, warehouses, and certainly hospitals continue to generate demand and trips. And so, you know, as they looked at Pittsburgh, okay, we're going to have to cut service. I can't remember the, you know, we've got to cut service 20 or 30 percent. We're not just going to do that across the board. Uh, we're going to do that in terms of the places and the times of day uh, where we do the least damage to the people who need us most. And so the, the people who need and use transit the most, those essential workers, again, it overlaps a lot with environmental justice, are prioritized and should be in, the, in the, both the triaging of what has to be eliminated, but then also need to be given preference as the service gets built back up and so that you make sure that as service, both as it's cut and as it's restored, that it is most responsive to the people who are most in need of it during this period, which, you know, tends, again, it's a magnification of the normal situation, which is true, you know, 365 days in a normal year as well. So I think there's a service planning part of this that really need, that agencies uh, need to be real conscious about. Agreed completely. And I've been wondering, um, kind of along the same vein with the improvements in air quality that we're seeing across the entire city um, in EJ communities, um, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing that that's actually been a disproportionately greater um, increase in air quality than other communities are experiencing. Um, and how do we find ways to to keep that air quality improved um, when things start to revert back to normal? How do we try to keep that air quality um, uh, good? Um, so we have about 15 minutes left and I just wanna see if we can hopefully end this on a positive note. Um, so I would like to ask, um, we're like, three weeks into this, three or four weeks into this, um, losing track of time. Um, but do you, do you think there's any takeaways so far um, from this experience that we can um, try to use to, to our benefit, um, to advocate for better transit, to advocate for safe streets, um, and just to make sure that streets are shared and for everyone, um, you know, down the line permanently. I can go first, I guess. Um, I think, I mean, just based on what we've seen in other crises, but knowing, I think, knowing about the goals that we have in California and in San Diego around climate change, around ensuring ac equitable access to all communities anywhere they want to go, um, that really, and I'm thinking about, you know, even the wonky thing of reducing vehicle miles traveled, <laughs> uh, which is one of those conundrums that California really hasn't solved yet. Um, we're reducing GHGs through electric vehicles and other measures, but we haven't been able to reduce VMT. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that we can really work collectively to take advantage of this moment to really refocus on policies and strategies that will help us reach those goals that have seemed so difficult um, in the past and to date and saying, and certainly not diminishing the fact that they're still challenging, but you know, I think the fact that Clint has said and, and others that people are really experiencing life differently throughout this crisis. And I think the, the need to, to congregate uh, in a safe way um, and then recognizing some of these long-term goals really sheds light on, I don't know, different things that the, the city and the state can do to reach those goals. And again, to be very targeted um, around those goals. I think on top of that too, I mean, we shouldn't take our eye off the, the long-term game here, right? At the end of the day, policy advocacy is, 
this incrementalism. Like you get opportunities every once in a while to make big changes, but you know, the the work that you know Circulate's done um, in terms of you know, pushing forward on parking reforms, uh, the work that you know that was done in coordination with, with San Diego the City Council and, and the mayor's office, the work to you know, work with MCS to put more housing near transit. You know these things create transit constituencies that don't exist today. Um, and to the extent that we can continue to grow those constituencies, you know, over the long term, you know, that's only going to go well for more advocacy from more voices, more diverse voices, uh, to encourage elected officials uh, and policymakers to go in the direction that a lot of the folks on this call would want us to, to go in. Um, you know, one of the ironic things out of this too, in terms of like the air quality, is you know, I, I think the SB 375 goals the state had set out uh, it was now 12 years ago were, were going to be unattainable. Uh, and now all of a sudden with our first headline here, 2020, you know, ironically, you know, we're going to hit it, but for no, you know, for not a, a tremendously set of good reasons, right? Like we, there's still a lot more hard work that needs to be done uh, to, continue to, to continue to push the envelope and continue to try to build you know, our cities to be better. And I think if you look at what's happened downtown over the last 15 years in terms of the, the growth downtown, the, the resurgence of our urban neighborhoods in San Diego and I think a lot of other cities as well, you know, continue to push for that long-term vision and that long-term goal of creating vibrant cities, I think will naturally create a constituency over the long run that will enable our, a lot of our goals. Yes. Yeah. I Definitely appreciate that. Oh, my screen has changed how it reflects on me based on the <laughs> changing of the light outside. That's weird. Okay, um, I didn't want to forget to ask David a question to share what he knows about the second rescue package that has started um, being talked about. Um, Transportation for America has come up with a list of 20 recommendations for it, including providing operating support, not just capital, and expanding transit and passenger rail. Can you share what you know about the plans um, or sure. the wishes you know, I really, for that? Yeah, I, I don't think anybody knows very much. I can tell you sort of uh, what, what we think and it coincides with our friends at Transportation for America, and I really recommend people look at their website, they have a very detailed list of ideas, uh, Transportation for America. But I think, and this picks up on some of what Kathleen and Clint were just saying, I would hope, and this is you answer your earlier question about, you know, positive, something positive, is that something, sometimes something so catastrophic causes us to really rethink some fundamentals and not just sort of tweak the existing system. And I, and I hope that that there may be some policy change that will come out. And, and this certainly this whole episode is, 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 is illustrating the frailty of a lot of our systems in this country, most notably the, you know, the public health system and Americans starting to question maybe some basic things that, that we are taken as if they were given or just um, automatic. The fact that our health insurance tends to be tied to our jobs well, if you suddenly have 20% unemployment and a health crisis at the same time, people suddenly start to think, well, maybe every other country, advanced country in the world is not wrong uh, to, to, to decouple healthcare insurance from employment. That's you know, in a different field. I, I, I would hope that this situation might cause us to rethink transportation planning and finance, and particularly the bias toward automobiles and road widening. And so how does that play out in terms of federal policy? The assumption in Washington, D.C. for 30 or 40 years is this is a road program and we'll give some crumbs to transit. But even that, even besides the proportions, the system is rigged against transit. We've touched on some of that incidentally here without recognizing that imbalance. The fact that we're talking about, well, now what about MTS's ballot measure for November? So we got, but we ought, really ought to be asking our question is, why is our transit system subject to the vicissitudes of, of quadrennial ballot measures and begging for permission to do something, especially California, where you have this two thirds thing that's insane. And nobody has really, well, actually that not ever, but 
it's very unusual for roads to ever have to go to the ballot. A lot of that's a trust fund. It just keeps spewing out money regardless of merit or need. And so we might ask ourselves, well, you know, we don't, we don't have ballot measures for sewer pipes. We don't say, oh, well, should we have water service or not? Let's go to the ballot. No, we have these because they are basic fundamental services. They're utilities that are part of having a civilized society. We don't subject them to the random whims of politics, nor do we make them overly dependent on a highly cyclical funding source like sales taxes. Again, we don't say, geez, sales taxes are down 10%. Uh, I guess we're going to have sewer service six days a week instead of seven days a week. And for on seven, one, the other day, don't flush the toilet. You know, that's not what a civilized society does. So I think that this, I would hope, this is my hope, is that this whole incident actually scraps the whole transportation planning and, and funding regime, which is so biased toward automobiles and so biased toward road expansion. And we come up with something much more more resilient and, and much more based on societal goals like greenhouse gas reduction, like access, like greater socioeconomic access and greater shared opportunity and prosperity among people who've been marginalized and then make transportation investments from a state standpoint of sort of steady, reliable revenue sources. That's a lot, that's a big dream. That's a dream, but as, as Clint said, maybe this is kind of point where it's such a shock to the system that we realize the way we've been doing it's not going to be sufficient. Um, so that's that's my big picture answer. Uh, you know, on the on the stimulus, which would actually be the fourth action. Con I think they've passed three relief bills. So Speaker Pelosi is talking about the upcoming one as a as a fourth. Uh, the concern I have about it is that that as Congress has want to do, they taking a very conventional approach and saying, let's throw a bunch of money at widening roads. Um, it, let's kind of just put 1956 policies on steroids and keep doing 1956 style stuff by putting a ton of new, uh, you know, fees that aren't even linked to user fees like the gas tax was. And, and we think that's good um, because that's, first of all, it doesn't employ a whole lot of people. It takes a long time. It's detrimental to the environment. It's, you know, it's bad in all the ways we've learned. So uh, that's something to really avoid. Uh, in terms of any further federal action. Absolutely. And again, I, again, I would just refer you to, to Transportation for America for what a good, a good stimulus would look like. Uh, we can't advocate for that as a civic foundation one way or another. We don't lobby, uh, but I can certainly refer you to uh, the educational uh, reading you can have on the Transportation for America website. Yeah, agreed. They have... Um really done a great job at making sure that transit um, is included in the rescue package that did pass and hopefully will be just as effective moving forward. Um, with that, uh, unless any of our panelists want to make a, a closing comments, I think we'll wrap up here right on time. I wanna thank our panelists for participating, for phoning in. Um, it's really um, been great to hear all these different perspectives, um, especially David, who's three hours ahead of us. Um, <laughs> so it's a little later for him. I really appreciate your time. Um, and for everyone who has tuned in, thank you so much. Um, we obviously, this is um, very early in um, this crisis. Uh, who knows how long this will go on. Um, so there's a lot more um, time, I think, to continue this conversation. Um, and I think we need to, of course, take care of ourselves and each other and the immediate threat. But hopefully we can find um, some good to come out of this that may not have happened otherwise. That's my hope. Um, Colin, I don't know if you're, I, I don't see you, but I don't know if you want to make a, any closing comments or pitch uh, to everyone to join Circulate San Diego. Are you there, Colin? Oh, we can't hear you. 
No, okay, never mind. Well, um, I'm going to drop the link in here uh, in case anybody wants. Oh, that was um, not to everyone. Anyways, uh, if you feel like supporting Circulate, the link is in the chat for everyone. Um, I hope you all take care of yourselves and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, take care. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Bye.